We're lucky enough to be back with Michael Waite, a hospital defense lawyer from Carbert Waite in Calgary, Alberta. If you haven't heard it yet, don't miss the longer podcast with Mike where he talks about his role as a hospital defense lawyer. He talks a lot about his um, own personal close call with COVID-19. And um, he offers some great advice to nurses and doctors and lawyers and patients about uh, avoiding malpractice lawsuits and avoiding litigation if you're a healthcare provider. In this podcast today, we're going to talk more about Mike is a person. And um, I'm really interested to hear because I've known Mike professionally for some time, but I'd have to say I don't know a lot about his personal life. So let's get started. So Mike, why did you choose to go into law and more specifically health law? Law was sort of always, uh, I think, my plan from high school, I guess. Like, it was really, I was generally better in English and social studies and that kind of thing. And uh, I'd always sort of been interested in the law. And so when I went, started my undergrad, I started in um, the business, sort of pre-business program at the U of C and with a view to doing that so that in case I wanted to take a few, little bit of time off in between degrees, I could maybe do something with that, but then ultimately go to law school. And then it turned out that I really didn't like statistics. That was one of the re- two required courses in the in the business program. So about, I don't know, a year and a half, two years into that, I pulled the ripcord and went into political science and finished an undergrad in political science. Took a bunch of history courses and, and really enjoyed it. And then went to law school. Uh, when I went into law school, I certainly had health law wasn't really on my radar screen. In fact, I was thought that I would be a criminal defense lawyer, either prosecutor or defense. And uh, so I was sort of on that road for the first, you know, year and a half or so of law school. And then started to really think, mm, I'm not sure I want to do that for a living. And so I was thinking more general litigation. And ultimately, my health law uh, interest just I fell into it as many people do in many uh, aspects of their lives. I um, sort of through the back door got an article at Bennett Jones. I had been on a moot team at the UC, which is a legal um, appellate uh, competition. Mm -hmm. And it had been sponsored and coached by Bennett Jones and I got to know some of the lawyers. And so um, for summer second year law school, I went to them and said, hey, I know you've already done your hiring and you don't normally hire second years, but hey, you want to give me a job? And so I got a summer job at Bennett Jones. And um, and then I got an article there. And basically at Bennett Jones at the time anyway, it's probably the same now. As a student, you can't possibly avoid doing medical malpractice work because the CMPA is a big client and students are involved in that. So I started doing that work and really liked it, really liked the people that do that work at Bennett Jones. They're still friends and colleagues. And um, sort of never looked back. It was a, I wanted it always to be a big part of my practice. And then when I decided to leave Bennett Jones, there was really only one place that I wanted to go, which was what is now my firm, um, because they did the hospital defense side. Instead of working for the doctors at Bennett Jones, I would work for the hospital. And uh, it just became a passion for me. And over the course of my career, you know, it's been anywhere from a third of my practice, then it moved to about half of my practice. And I'd say now it's probably two thirds of my practice. Mm. I'm always in awe of um, how much medicine, health law lawyers have to learn, like in awe of it. Because certainly, you know, so much more about health care and the details of medicine than, than any health care provider could say they know about law. Have you enjoyed that learning or has it been a really tough learning curve for you to come up to speed? And every case must be so different that you'll have to learn. Yeah, I would say both. It's tough, but I do love it. Like Mm -hmm. what I often say to people about litigation is, you know, so many lawyers want to specialize and there's lots of good reasons to do that, right? You want to become known for something. It's good for business development and it's also good just that you're not sort of learning new stuff and reinventing the wheel all the time. Well, I can have the best of both worlds in health law because I'm doing an area of law, but I go from a cancer case to an emergency case to an obstetrical case to an orthopedic case, whatever. And I have to learn 
about that medicine and talk to experts and I have to get up to speed enough that I don't sound like an idiot when I talk to the experts and be able to ask the right questions. Because unless you have some basic understanding of the medicine, you can't, you don't even know what questions to ask and you could miss something huge. So that's probably the thing I like the best about health law is that it, it forces me to, uh, to learn those things. And, uh, you know, if in, in another life, I might've wanted to try to be a doctor, but I wasn't good enough at sciences and I didn't like biology in high school. So <laughs> that kind of ended it, but it's kind of allowed me to be a, it ain't over my, <laughs> yeah, well, it's over for me, but it's, uh, it's a way to kind of have that interest uh, fulfilled um, while still doing law. Yeah, for sure. That's good. That's good. So you do a lot of, you know, you dabble in a lot of different areas in law, as we discussed earlier when I was outlining your professional expertise and your interests. But what do you do when you're not busy working? Um, well, we have a place out in BC that... Um, where we spend a lot of our time. It's certainly in the summer, we try to spend as much time out there as possible. So I spend a lot of time driving the boat for the kids and, and for my wife who loves to wake surf behind the boat. Mm. And uh, I also wake surf and I slalom ski and, and just we love, it's sort of Mara Lake and Shushwap Lake and we love spending time out there and go for long boat rides and that kind of thing. Um, outside of that, when we're home, I'm a hockey dad. Both boys are in um, hockey, thankfully, at least for our life, they're not, um, they're pretty solid players and they're sort of getting towards the top end, but they're not in that sort of double A world where you're traveling all the time and, right. and it sort of takes over the family's life. But I love spending time in the hockey rink watching their games. Um, and I really loved when they got to the age where I could just drop them off for practices. Because so I don't, <laughs> watching practices is not exciting. Right. It's uh, 530 in the morning. Yeah. And I, yeah, I do, um, uh, I do some volunteer work. I'm on a couple boards, and uh, but yeah, I think that would probably be the biggest thing. Is um, outside of work would be my volunteer work and and hockey. Mm. Well, it's a busy time in your life when you've got kids at home and in those sports. And um, what do you like? Do you have any thoughts about what direction your kids are going with their on their career path? And do you have hopes or encouragement for them to go into either healthcare or law? So if I had, a, if I was consulted or actually had a say, um, I mean, I'd love for one of my boys to become a f physician. I mean, that just would, I think would be really cool. Again, it's that, it's my um, sort of desire to peek into the windows of, of medicine and, and learn, um, learn about medicine. So that would be cool. Um, yeah, I don't really think that's going to happen. And, you know, it's funny because a lot of lawyers will really discourage their kids from careers in law. And mm -hmm. uh, I'm not one of those. I'm also not somebody who's cheerleading for law. It, it's it's a hard profession. It's stressful. It, you have to have the right personality and ability to set, not make other people's problems that you're constantly paid to try to solve become your own problems. Uh and that, you know, some people are better at that than others. Uh, so, but I, it's also a very fulfilling career and it's very flexible. Like you can do lots of different things with it. You can practice in private practice, you can work in business, you can become an entrepreneur. I know lots of people that I worked with at Bennett Jones went into business and part of, you know, either um, investment banking, um, financing type people or, CEOs of oil and gas companies and stuff like that. Um, I think my my older son might be leaning towards something in law. Um, he he likes cars, <laughs> and so he's quite intent on trying to make sure he has some kind of career where he has enough money that he can trick Buy out cars? his cars. Um, <laughs> not necessarily expensive cars, but he has lots of ideas about modifying cars. So I've told him, he's 14, and I've told him that when he turn, turns 16, um, he'll be able to use the current car that I'm driving, which is an Acura TL. Sedan, not a cool car. Mm -hmm. um, and he's sort of grudgingly agreeing to, to drive the car, but he wants to trick it out. So he's already looking at <laughs> spoilers and lowering the suspension and bigger wheels and all this stuff. And I'm like, 
on an Acura TL. I just, whatever. Yes, that's his thing. <laughs> it's a place to start, right? <laughs> and then my younger son is, um, he's really into military uh, stuff. He's, he loves tanks and, and um, he's starting to talk about maybe doing um, cadets or something like that. And, but he's, he thinks engineering or um, architecture, some kind of design kind of aspect mm -hmm. to it. Um, so, I mean, my, my view is whatever makes them happy and they don't have to be a professional by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so I think a lot of people are happier if they're not. So mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage or discourage either of them from going into law, I guess is the long answer to your question. Mm. Well, it's interesting. And it's interesting. It'll be interesting to look back on where they are now and where they, you know, to talk about this 15 or 20 years from now and see where they are there. I mean, we're here at a studio. Um, it's Wind Sparks Fly Studios, and it's owned by my son, Steve, who you've met earlier today. And we we're having a conversation just a few weeks ago that I remember very clearly around the kitchen table when Steve was uh, 10 or 11, maybe. And the other two kids were like seven and five. And they both told me on that day exactly what they were going to do. You know, my youngest daughter said, I'm going to have a big job in a big city. And she's in New York right now. And she has a global position as a marketing officer. My second daughter said, I'm going to stay home and bake cookies and have babies. And that's exactly what she's doing <laughs> at this very minute. And Steve said he was going to be a musician. And they took a really wiggly path to get there. It was a winding road and they did all sorts of things. But... You know, 20 years later, they were all exactly where they told me they were going to be around the kitchen table when they were little. So that's been a fascinating thing to watch as a parent. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's been interesting. So um, I, I recognize and I appreciate that you said that law is tough and being a professional is tough. And how do you hope, though, that your, all the hard work that you're doing in healthcare might change healthcare in the future or better it in some way? Well, one thing that... Um that has always been a part of our practice and has become more so in recent years is really focusing on um, patient safety and risk management recommendations. So uh, we, in every case that we have, turn our minds to um, what happened and what could we possibly recommend that might avoid something like that happening again in the future. And uh, so we provide that advice to our clients and with recommendations. And sometimes it's it comes from our own experience and expertise and the, that of the, the health providers that are involved in the case. And sometimes it's assisted by experts who provide us that expertise. And obviously, if we can provide that information to the, the client with the backup of well-respected experts telling us, that's always helpful. So I think that's... Um, you know, one of the things that I feel in a very small way that we play a role in improving the system and making healthcare safer is by drawing to the attention of the system um, some issues that they may or may not have been aware of and that where things can go wrong. And I do seminars and presentations and that kind of thing. You know, often talk to physicians and nurses about how to provide safe care. And so I think... Um, you know, that's how I feel that both what we do in our firm, but also the legal system in general can contribute is um, by making sure that these things don't just be treated as a one-off where, okay, it's a case, someone got harmed, the case was settled, move on, right? Uh, it would be such a waste of, of time, money, and, and the impact that that had on the family if nothing sort of good came of it. So, and I don't know necessarily that the general public or plaintiff's counsel even know how much goes into patient safety and risk management in the healthcare system. It's, it's a huge part of what they do every day is trying to find ways to make the system safer and to ensure that people are trained properly and, and all of that. So we play a very small part in that, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I feel that it's important. I'm glad you said that because I don't even know that you know, nurses and doctors are fully aware. I mean, I wouldn't until this very moment known that that was a big part of what you do other than a personal interest that you'd expressed earlier. Because it seems like the trickle down takes a long time, you know, where you know something's happened and then you don't hear anything about it for a long time and then there's a new policy or there's a change in policy or change in procedure. So I appreciate that you said that. That's 
that's really good for all of us to know, I think. Um, what um, You mentioned all sorts of stuff going on in your life. You've had some family struggles with health issues and your wife and your son, and you've got a tough job, and it's a tough time right now. You know, this year 2020 has brought challenges for all of us. What sort of stuff keeps you up at night? Um, well, I think a few things. I think, you know, obviously, like every parent, you worry about your kids. You know, you worry about what kind of a parent you're being. And you always try to, I don't know if everyone always feels this way, but I've always felt this way, that I don't want to make the mistakes that um, you know, my parents did, or, um, I want to, I want to be a different dad than my dad was. And, and so that sometimes keeps me up at night as far as, am I doing enough? Am I, um, am I getting through? Am I supporting? Am I doing everything that I can do to, to, uh, to support my kids? We'll obviously make all kinds of mistakes. They'll just be different ones, hopefully than, than other, than my, my parents made. Um, you know, on the on the work side, I mean, it is stressful, and there are times when I do wake up in the middle of the night thinking about a, a file, and you know, whether it's oh, did I do that, or think you know, and you have these fictitious memories about um, cases that have either never existed or long since been settled. I had a recurring dream about I was acting for this elderly lady, and I, I don't even really know the nature of the thing, but it was, it, so it was all made up in my brain, but it was just a function of the stress that you're always under as a lawyer, right? You're having to make sure that you're not missing deadlines and that you're not some some way making a mistake that's going to impact your client. And I was this, it was always an elderly lady, and I had totally screwed up, and then I, I couldn't, but I couldn't seem to fix the mistake, and it was just like you're just sort of stuck on a treadmill, and um, so that, you know, I think that's, if you asked a bunch of lawyers, I think there's probably a version of that for most litigators, at least, right, where you just think, oh my god, I must have made a mistake, because, you know, it feels like pretty much every day you work, you're just trying to prevent making a mistake, right, right. you're just trying to not <laughs> screw something up. Right. <laughs> which is not always easy. But. <laughs> I'm sure that'll resonate with a lot of people. <laughs> you go home <laughs> at the end of the day and think, ah, did I get, did I do it all? Did I get everything done? And what, um, I mean, it's obvious that you take, that you not only try hard at excelling as in your personal life, in your professional life, but um, so what is it about it that gets you up in the morning? Like, do you wake up excited to go to work or see your kids or live your life? What gets you up? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm blessed. I really enjoy what I do. I mean, it, it's hard and sometimes it's stressful and there are certainly days and I, particularly if I'm dealing with a case that I don't love for one reason or another, um, it, you know, it's not easy. It's, I don't spring out of bed every day, but you know, I, I'm lucky to have found something that is really fulfilling and I feel like it's more than just the battle of you know, f fighting over something for billable hours, right? You know, I'm, I'm for the most part in the health law practice, at least, um, feel like I'm, you know, playing a part in the system and um, helping health professionals and, and, you know, helping in a way, families and patients and ensuring that they get compensation when they deserve it. And, you know, so that that's fulfilling. And it it's like, I enjoy it. I like that piece of what I do. You know, personally, you know, I love, um, you know, I've, I'm not an early riser and our kids go to school late. So I love the fact that almost every morning we're able to interact in the morning and have some breakfast together or whatever. And, you know, then we go about our, our days and, um, not, you know, we've, we've been eating a lot more at dinner as a family, with COVID, which is sort of a side benefit because we're home so much together so much more often. And that's great. Uh, but, you know, I just spending time with them, especially our time at the lake is really cherished by all of us. And uh, because, you know, life's busy during the school year and Shelly is a lawyer, my wife's a lawyer and she's busy as well. And so we kind of get through the winter in order to have our summers at the lake. And we love to travel. Unfortunately, travel is off the books right now, but uh, we've had some great trips with our boys, and it was a commitment to us that we made to each other that we wanted to at least have a big trip every 18 months or so while the kids were at that age where it's not too complicated by 
part-time jobs or girlfriends or university or whatever. Right, because that's common. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we really try to do that, and mm-hmm. that's um, a big part of why both Shelley and I go to work every day is to yeah. pay for those uh, experiences. Right. Good. And are you getting through this okay? Because COVID has taken away a lot of the opportunity for those experiences away. But I guess we just all have to keep in mind that this is one day going to be in the rearview mirror, right? This isn't forever. This is just for a while. But are you finding ways to just keep the faith? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Grin and bear it, or Mm -hmm. an expression that my wife likes to use, suck it up, buttercup, right? I mean, at the end of the day, there's not much you can do. And so, you know, I, you know, both of us have really focused on making sure that this has as little lasting impact on our kids as possible. And, and they've been really resilient in many ways, more resilient than we are. Uh, the no travel thing is hard, but you know, I have seen saying that out loud feels so pretentious and, and privileged, right? Lots of people don't ever have an opportunity to do some of the things we've done and we've done some amazing trips and, um, it too will come again. And so, um, we will spend time at, our place in BC and do some skiing and we'll, you know, have our summer again out there and hopefully this uh, will pass in 2021. But it's, yeah, like what I say to the people that I lead at the firm is everybody's nerves are on the outside of their skin. And I think we just need to accept that, right? It's, this has been hard to one extent or another for everyone in our community. And you, you got to you got to appreciate that when you communicate with other people and you interact with other people that you're not necessarily going to get the this response that you normally would get or the and so bear that in mind and just try to be kind to each other and try to go out of your way to still have interactions and yeah. uh, you know I sent an email out to the whole firm yesterday because of the new restrictions in Alberta and one of the things I said is just you know set up a Zoom meeting for no other reason, just to say hi. Because a lot of people, you know, haven't been in our office since March, or very rarely. Um, so they don't have the kind of connections that you normally would have. Yeah. And our firm has a great culture. Um, a lot we're friends, and we miss that. We miss those interactions. And, uh, you know, we spend more time working than we do pretty much anything else in our lives. Uh, we got to find ways to, to connect and and so that's how we're managing through it and and um you know a little bit of uh um after after work drink and and uh and some enjoyment where you can is uh is also part of the plan yeah well good and good luck (laughs) to you and to everyone else going through this right now just uh an interesting question what would you say that most people uh or what do people most often get wrong about you I think um, people that don't know me well uh, would say that I'm. Um, it's a, depend your what adjective you choose: intimidating, um, uh, arrogant, or cold. Like I'm sort of standoffish uh, be, uh, w- until you get to know me. So can I interject a word there? Sure. Because you know there's some version of that, but I know when I first met you, you come across as very um, authoritative. I don't, so I wouldn't say you're, I wouldn't have called it arrogant or cold, but I was a little scared of you because <laughs> you come across with a confidence and a sense of authority that you just don't want to mess with. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, I guess. But it, I mean, that is consistent with what some people will say. And, right. and you know, especially like as new lawyers join our firm and, you know, uh, the lawyers that know me well, like one of my partners will say to me, like, you know, Mike, you just think you're a big teddy bear and, you might be, but it takes a while to see that. And so mm-hmm. I think for me, people sort of get that wrong. That You know, I am reserved. I'm not, um, like, I'm outgoing, but I'm not, like, lampshade on the head, life of the party kind of uh, gregarious. Uh, no. And so people, um, I think, sometimes mistake that for being aloof or whatever. And mm-hmm. so I'd say that's what people get wrong about me. Mm-hmm. I'm just a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here, folks. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Mike weighs a big teddy bear. Mm-hmm. Um, and one last question. what, uh, Knowing what you know now about life and health and work and 
jobs and kids and marriage and everything you know what advice would you give your younger self if you could i think i would say don't take yourself so seriously like i was a kid that i had to grow up pretty early or at least that's how i felt i felt that i needed to um to be self-sufficient and um take care of myself and not rely on other people and um, you know, I, I did take myself pretty seriously sort of in my teens and early 20s where, you know, I sort of had a plan and I need to, needed to get there and, and really um, was focused. And I think what if I could time travel, I would say lighten up, you know, because as it turned out, I ended up sort of missing my early 20s. And there's, there's personal reasons that it, we don't need to go into, but it just was... Um, you know, in a relationship that that uh, wasn't right, and I, but I felt like I had to do it because I was that guy. I was the stand-up guy, and um, so I really missed the kind of the twenties that every not everybody, but a lot of other people have, where you're kind of footloose and fancy free, and and um, I got it later on. So in the middle of law school, I you know I became able to travel, and so I kind of just did thing in my late twenties that I would have like to have done in my early 20s and mm-hmm. so that's that's what I would go back and say is don't take yourself so seriously life yeah. is lighten life up. is short lighten up mm-hmm. well the good news is is that um you know I'm finding at this point in my life as the kids grow up and the work slows down a little bit it's um it's amazing how you can find time for that fun again because I would say I, my trajectory was not too far off yours just out of the house at 17 and went for it you know and um but, you know, the year I turned 45, I think, or maybe 50, you know, I started to misbehave and my kids have had to rescue me as many times as I've had to rescue them. So there's fun ahead. There's fun and time for play ahead. So For sure. We can embarrass our children and I look forward to doing that. It's my favorite thing to yeah. do. <laughs> Just ask Steve and he'll tell you. Anyway, um, let's wrap this up. Uh, thank you once again. Let's call it a day. I really appreciate your openness and your sharing and I wish you all the best with all that's going on in your life and um, hopefully we'll talk again before too long. Sounds good, thanks. Thank you.